Okay, Trent. Uh, so this is um, the first video in your homework, which is essentially going to just be a description of how sequencing works. And um, I'm going to try and lay out the basics, which you've seen before, about how Illumina sequencing libraries are prepared. Um, and then I'll go into a little bit of how we sequence Illumina libraries, you know, how the actual machine that does the sequencing itself works. And then after we talk about that, um, I'm going to try and outline a little bit of uh, how uh, we handle that data. Um, but I'm, I'm going to start and focus, um, and, and I may only get to this, uh, a description of how to make a library because that's what uh, most people need to know who are doing the molecular biology side of things. And it can be a little bit tedious, but it really helps if you understand what you're doing. So I'll go into what's going on. So this is the outline step, all right? So as an outline, you may remember this um, from before, but I'll describe it again, which is uh, you have DNA, all right? And uh, DNA, which, you know, looks something like this, right? You have, you know, nice little double helix, and you have these base pairs, um, is really long. So it goes a long way in both directions. And if, you know, you zoom out and you draw the whole thing, then it looks something like this, you know, an incredibly long, molecule for each chromosome and normally it's all coiled up with all these proteins that it's associated with but you know once you isolate it it's just a long snaky molecule okay and uh, you uh, when you isolate you will I isolate from many cells right so you have many different copies of the same molecule you know you get one from each cell a little less than that because the DNA preparation isn't actually perfect you know you lose a little bit in that process but you end up with a lot of copies of the same DNA molecule, right? And the first step in Illumina sequencing is to fragment this DNA all over the place. You randomly fragment, and remember you do that using the Covaris machine, and I, I showed you what a Covaris machine does, but basically you have a little tube that looks something like this, you have a little bit of fluid in it, in that tube, and then you put it into this machine, that has a little water bath, and there's a little thingamajiggy down here. I don't know what it is exactly. And you sonicate the crap out of it, okay? And that generates all these little breaks, right? All these breaks, which are these red X's. So each of these red X's is a break. And it does that randomly, so that then you end up with random fragments, right? From different places in the genome. And some of them will overlap, right? Because just because you broke one of the DNA strands here and here, you know, there's another strand that might have been broken in the middle of that same sequence and then a little bit farther off the edge. So uh, you have all these fragments, they're from all over the place, uh, and they're random, and that's good. So, and you'll see why it's good later on when I talk to you a little bit about variant calling. Okay, so once you do that, uh, if we zoom in on one of these fragments, and we talked about this before, zoom in on one of those fragments, it actually is not perfect. It has these overhangs. Remember, this is the five prime end of the DNA and the three prime end, and then anti-parallel to that is the five prime end here and the three prime end here, right? This little end is three prime, that little end is five prime, that end's three prime, that end's five prime. And so this is what's called a five prime overhang and a three prime overhang. And what we do with that is we need to repair that. So we need to turn that into a blunt fragment, right? We need to like, get rid of these overhanging sections here. So let me highlight those overhanging sections. That's an overhang. That's an overhang. So we need to get rid of that, and that's called blunting or uh, end repair. Actually, it's called end repair more frequently. End repair. Okay. So then you have this little guy, and it doesn't have those overhangs on the end. And then you need to take that little guy and you need to put an additional overhanging base on the three prime ends, right? So let, let me label my ends. So this is three prime here, this is five prime for this strand. This is five prime here, this is three prime. Keeping track here, three prime and five prime. Tedious, but incredibly important. And uh, here, you know, it's the same, right? So here's the three prime. And we're going to add a little extra overhang here, and it's going to be an A, right? And that's going to help make that end sticky so that we can paste something onto it. So we have a little A here, 
and this is called a tailing. Oops, let me use a different color. Use a different color. Just uh, so we're going to call that a tailing. A tail. You know, here are the a's right here. That's what we added, and uh, that step's really important. And then, after that is done, we're going to do something else, which is we're going to ligate. This is just an outline. I'll go into each of these steps in detail later. We ligate on these adapters. And they're called adapters because these adapters are a known sequence that we're going to use to connect things up later on uh, when we actually use the sequencing machine. So to ligate on adapters, what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, these known sequences, and I'll draw these known sequences in blue. You have a known sequence like this, okay? And it has, so see how this has an A overhang here? This guy has a T overhang, T overhang right there. And the T overhang is very nice because the T, as you know, is complementary to an A in Watson-Crick base pairing. And so they like to hang out together. They like to hang out. And then this sequence is some sequence that we know. So it's like maybe C-A-T, T, G, A, whatever. But we know this sequence. And we, when we ligate, we attach that sequence covalently. And the covalently is important. It's not just associating through this TA Watson Crick base pairing. We're actually sealing up these points here and connecting it to this genomic fragment here, which is a big question mark. We don't know what's in that sequence. This we know, this we don't. And then at this end here, we also, again, are going to attach to the same genomic Sorry, the same adapter, not the same genomic fragment, and we'll seal that up. Okay. Now this doesn't always work perfectly, so you're also in this reaction, this ligation reaction, ligation reaction with adapters. And these are the adapters. This is the fragment. This is another adapter. At the same step, we need to do. Uh, we need. To, uh, sorry, after this step, we need to do something to make sure that the fragments that we get. Uh, didn't kind of, kind of mess up fragments. So sometimes you'll get a mess up where you have the adapter with the T overhang, and then somehow accidentally it ligated to another adapter. Okay, this is bad. You don't want this to happen. And it actually doesn't too much because the T's don't like each other. The T likes the A, doesn't like each other. But what's more common is that you'll get a nice sequence here and you'll only ligate it to one adapter. Right, so you have one adapter on one side, and on the other side, oops, this is an oops right here. Nothing. There's nothing. You don't ligate to another adapter. So what we then do, and this is something that you should be familiar with at this point, is we do PCR. Okay. So if you remember PCR, what you need is you need two sequences, one on the left, so you need a left adapt, uh, sorry, a left primer, and you need a right primer, and that those need to be pointing in the opposite direction. So the left primer primes this way, and the right primer primes that way. Okay. So the way we do that is the left primer is just complementary to this adapter sequence here, right? So it just complements this. So it kind of imitates this strand right here. And for the right primer, all we do is we just imitate this strand right here. It's super simple. So we have one primer. And actually, these, these two sequences are a little different. There's something called a forked adapter, which I'll go into in more detail, to make sure that, uh, to make sure that the, the sequences on the left and the sequences on the right aren't actually the same. Because you can see here, if you think about it, and this might be a little bit obscure, but this sequence here is actually exactly the same flipped around, you know, 180 degrees as this sequence here in the way I've drawn it. And that's because I've lied to you a little bit, but I'll go into detail about how that actually works. And uh, it'll be a little puzzling. It might take me a little while. But, um, but essentially what you're doing is you're using the fact that fragments that have ligated correctly will have a primer on the left side and the right side to amplify off of. 
And this guy, he just has one, right? Just has one. So while this guy is amplifying exponentially, like that, the other guy, this guy here, this oops here, he, every, every time you amplify, you're just going to go once. You're never going to go in the backwards direction, right? You can't amplify this direction. So rather than amplifying exponentially, it's just going to go linearly, okay? So that after, you know, after you go far enough out here, if you do enough cycles, so this is the number of cycles you do, it's about eight, you have a ton of amplified fragments that have adapters on both sides, and you have a comparatively very tiny amount of these mess up fragments that have adapters only on one side. Okay, and I'll, I'll go into detail on all this stuff so that I know that I may have confused you here, but that, that's, that's how that works and it's kind of important, so we'll talk about it in more detail, but this is just an outline. Okay, so uh, now that you've done a PCR, what do you have? Well, now you have abundantly, right, and overwhelmingly, you have these nice fragments with adapter, so let me just write this, adapter, sequence. You have a genomic fragment, a nice little genomic fragment in the middle. And remember this was your A and this is your T. And these stuck together and that's part of what made this work. And this is your A again. And there's going to be a T over here. And then it's a sandwich, right? Because we did that PCR and that exponentially increased your amount of sandwiched fragments. Okay, so this little guy, this guy, he is uh, now your overwhelming product, this thing. And uh, hey, guess what? That's a library. A library is a lot of fragments like this in which you have, you have this uh, adapter, fragment, adapter, fragment, and adapter. kind of molecule, and all these fragments are different, right? These are all different. Well, you've actually amplified these, so they're not 100% different, but you have, mostly you have a lot of different fragments in the middle. They come from different places in the genome, and they come from different places in the genome because you did this random shearing thing up here, right? Remember this random shearing approach that you took? So you did the random shearing, and now you have those random sheared bits attached to these adapters. And this whole mess is really just to make sure that you can get these adapters stuck to the end of it, stuck to the end of these fragments, so that you can put them on to an aluminum machine. And that aluminum machine is called either the GA2, right, they use the Roman numeral 2, right, because they're fancy, uh, or a HiSeq. These are the names of the machines, HiSeq GA2. Company is Illumina. High throughput sequencing. High throughput, blah, but sequencing machine. Okay? And these machines, they look awesome. I think I showed them to you one of the first days that you came in, but it's like a big box. It's got a little light on the side and a little computer over here that kind of runs the whole thing and, you know, a little thingamajangle and, uh, and this light, you know, looks like Hal or something like that. Anyway, it's all very uh, fancy, and I'll tell you about how that works. But um, basically what this machine is going to do is it's going to take all these little fragments and it's going to tell you, hey, this is what's in your fragment. Or at least these are 100 nucleotides of what's in your fragment. And then, you know, you have to figure out, it's going to say, oh, well, this is an A, this is a G, this is a T, because you didn't know what these were, but you'll find out A, C, G, G, A, T, or something like that. And you're going to get tons of information, lots of different little bits of sequence. These are called sometimes tags, sometimes they're called reads, and that information you can then use to figure out what the genome sequence is and what kinds of mutations are present. Okay, I think that's enough for my outline. I think I may have already overwhelmed you in my outline, but uh, that is step one, and I'll go into each of these in detail and sort of chemically how they work so that when you're doing them, uh, you know what's going on because you should, you should know what you're doing uh, when you're doing molecular biology. It's not too complicated. Uh, it's not rocket science. Okay, I'll see you in the next video.